It is April 1943. A year ago, the Japanese stood proud and victorious in the Pacific, having beaten their enemies at Malaya, the Philippines, the Dutch East Indies, Burma, and at pretty much every place they had attempted to invade. But today the tide has turned completely in favour of the Allies, who had successfully checked them at Midway and the Kokoda Track, culminating with triumphant counter-offensives to retake Guadalcanal and the Bunagona area. Now, with the subsequent capture of the Russell Islands and the disastrous Battle of the Bismarck Sea, all signs pointed to a continuous Allied offensive that would not stop until the Empire was brought to its knees. Admiral Yamamoto, mastermind of the Pearl Harbor attack and commander-in-chief of the combined fleet, knew that Japan needed some time to prepare a new set of defenses if the Empire hoped to survive. Thus, he would set forth to launch a massive air offensive against the Allied positions in the South Pacific. Join us as we delve into Yamamoto's last offensive, Operation Ego. Hey history fans, as you know, the YouTube algorithm precludes us from releasing more than 3 or 4 videos per week. As the more we release, the lower the average views are, which hurts the overall standing of the channel in search rankings and such. Still, we produce more videos than that, and we want to give our viewers a chance to watch them. Videos are now published as YouTube member and Patreon exclusives. For just $5 per month, yes, one cup of coffee, you'll get access to 25 new videos. Currently, we're running two battle series, the Peloponnesian Wars and the Italian Unification Wars. Click the link in the description or pinned comment, and you'll get exclusive videos, early access to all videos, learn our schedule, get access to our private Discord, watch our behind-the-scenes videos, and much more. Thank you for watching and your kind support. We wouldn't be able to do what we love without you. As we last saw, the situation had changed drastically for the Japanese Empire in the Pacific War. While the Allies planned to undertake the next phase of offensives against Japan, in what would be known as Operation Cartwheel, the Japanese were also shifting their priorities to the successful defense of New Guinea, particularly the key Lei Salamawa area. This is why Admiral Yamamoto and the combined fleet staff were greatly incensed by the disaster that transpired in the Bismarck Sea, as the Japanese convoy was meant to reinforce Lei. They were also concerned about the state of land-based aviation, which had failed to protect the convoy during the battle. Recognizing that Admiral Kasaka's 11th Air Fleet had suffered many losses in the last few months, including most of its original air crews. Furthermore, the remaining air groups also suffered from a series of serious issues, but there were two that were most important, the poor health and poor morale that Rabol was experiencing due to widespread diseases, including malaria and chronic diarrhea, and the poor quality of replacements for the original veterans, many of them unfamiliar with the aircraft employed in Kasaka's command and requiring to be trained again after their arrival. The accelerated flow of replacement aircrews to the front lines was actually a fleet-wide trend, as the IJN shortened the training syllabus for commissioned and enlisted pilots by two months. To achieve this reduction, the amount of instructional time devoted to skill areas such as gunnery, tactics and formation flying was reduced, or in some cases eliminated. Surviving pilots that had started the war in the third position of a three-plane sector even rose to the role of Shotai or Chutai leaders without having the experience to really assume such responsibilities. Thus, the March 25th directive to establish a superior and impregnable strategic position finally put an end to the Great Southern Offensive, as Tokyo implored Army and Navy to operate as one unit in the defense of their precious gains while at the same time maintaining pressure on the Allied forces in New Guinea. To implement this new directive, General Imamura decided to summon a conference on Rabaul on April 12, attended by the commanders of the 17th and 18th Armies, the 6th Air Division, and units under direct Army Area Command. At this conference, it would be decided that General Hyakutake's 17th Army was to assume responsibility for the defense of the Northern Solomons, in coordination with the Navy, with the additional mission of assisting them during the incoming attacks on the Central Solomons. 
while General Adachi's 18th Army was to secure a firm strategic position at Le Salamaua via the establishment of overland and coastal supply routes, linking Madang and western New Britain with the Le area. The construction of naval and air bases on the eastern New Guinean coast was also to be sped up, so that the 6th Air Division of Lieutenant General Itahanagiichi could gradually advance its bases of operations there. Though a step in the right direction for the Japanese, these orders would be difficult to accomplish, as American aircraft had already made destroyer runs to Finchhafen impossible, further wearing down the strength of the Japanese units in New Guinea with constant air attacks. Therefore, the only means of moving men and supplies to Leh would be through slow and arduous transport by submarine and small craft, and the debilitated forces already stationed there would be unable to take any offensive action. But there was also a small offensive element in the March 25th plan, directing the IJN to start an air campaign against Allied positions in the Solomons and New Guinea. Knowing that the 11th Air Fleet by itself was incapable of mounting an effective strike, Admiral Yamamoto called upon the 3rd Fleet, now under the command of Admiral Ozawa, to contribute its carrier air groups to the effort. Thus, the carriers Zuikaku, Zuiho, Junyo and Hiyo would contribute over 160 aircraft to the 155 already under the command of Admiral Kosaka for an estimated total of 350 aircraft. After initially concentrating in Rabaul, these plans were dispersed to several airfields on Bougainville and the Shortlands for Operation Ego, the massive air counter-offensive scheduled to start on April 5th. In the meantime, Kosaka decided to send a preliminary fighter sweep down the slot on April 1st, hoping to draw out and destroy a large percentage of the Allied fighters at Guadalcanal. After launching 54 Zeros in two separate waves, the Japanese raiders would be intercepted by 42 fighters from Admiral Mason's Comair Sol's command over the Russell Islands, starting a giant melee that lasted nearly three hours. Fighting over their own territory, the Americans would shoot down nine Zeros at the cost of five Wildcats and a Corsair. This was not a promising start for the Japanese, but inflated reports would nonetheless leave them satisfied about this first attack. On April 3rd, Yamamoto and his staff would finally arrive at Rabaul, as he was to personally take command of the operation alongside Admirals Kosaka and Ozawa. Although the air counter-offensive was to start on April 5th with Attack X, the planned strike against Guadalcanal, bad weather would finally force the Japanese to postpone it for two days. The Japanese would find no shortage of tempting targets on Guadalcanal or in the surrounding anchorages. During the few short weeks since they had conceded the island, the Americans had completed its third airstrip, and Guadalcanal had become a supply depot with massive dumps of munitions, fuel and weapons. Japanese reconnaissance flights on March 25th further revealed approximately 300 Allied planes on the island, and the snoopers counted numerous transports, cargo ships and warships riding at anchor between Lunga Point and Tulagi. In the early hours of April 7th, Attack X would finally be launched under the personal supervision of Yamamoto as a massive strike force of 110 Zeros and 67 D-3A dive bombers lifted off en route to Guadalcanal, shortly stopping at the Shortlands to refuel. Additionally, a separate group of 47 Zeros from the 11th Air Fleet took off from Buka and also headed southeast, for a grand total of 224 planes, the largest Japanese striking force since Pearl Harbor. Yet the Allies enjoyed an experienced and talented intelligence network at this point in the war, so they would receive several warnings of the impending attack. It's worth highlighting the remarkable work of Australian Coast Watchers, who had been transmitting reports of their visual sightings ever since the start of the Pacific War. Consequently, Rear Admiral Mark Mitscher, the new commander of Air Souls, began to scramble 76 fighters from Henderson Field and the outlying airstrips, though in great disorder. And despite the early detection, the Japanese also bought extra time by cleverly splitting the attack force into four groups, which created initial confusion amongst the Allied radar controllers. As the four squadrons of VALs were preceded by two sweeps of fighters, three squadrons of Wildcats would get to intercept them, rapidly engaging in an air duel. Yet despite their best efforts, they would be unable to prevent the Vals from attacking targets in Tulagi Anchorage. 
As a result, three ships would be sunk. The veteran American destroyer Aaron Ward, the small New Zealander corvette Moa, and the US tanker Kanawa, of 14,500 tons. Luckily, the Americans were able to evacuate their bombers from Henderson Field before it got attacked, so not much damage would be scored against Guadalcanal. After the fight broke up, most of the surviving Vals and Suros would head back towards Bougainville, though some would have to ditch or land at Munda. Japanese losses in this engagement totaled 12 Zeros and 12 Vals, including that of future writer Toyoda Minoru, who would be later rescued and imprisoned by the Americans. In turn, the Japanese aviators claimed 41 American planes destroyed, although only 7 Wildcats were lost, and the dive bomber crews claimed to have sunk 12 major vessels. So Yamamoto and his staff were very pleased by the outcome of this strike. Because of this apparent success, Yamamoto would proceed to approve Attack Operation Y, a series of air raids against bases in New Guinea. The first would be carried out on April 11th, as 73 Zeros and 27 carrier dive bombers departed Rabaul and attacked Oro Bay, adjacent to the rapidly expanding aerodrome complex at Dobadura. A total of 50 Allied fighters scrambled from Dobadura and intercepted the force, shooting down two Zeros and four Vals without loss. Despite the number of Japanese aircraft involved, the results were surprisingly modest. Only one American cargo vessel sunk, a transport heavily damaged, and an Australian minesweeper damaged. Early the next morning, Yamamoto travelled to Vunakano Aerodrome to personally send off another strike, this time against Port Moresby. An inspiring sight in his crisp white uniform, he waved to the passing crews as 43 G4M medium bombers lifted off shortly followed by an escort of 65 Zeros. A separate fighter sweep of 66 Zeros was also assigned to the raid, for a grand total of 174 aircraft. Flying in two large formations, the Japanese initially headed towards Milner Bay, which allowed the Americans to detect them with a radar station. Consequently, General Kenny would scramble every operational fighter on the near side of the Owen Stanleys. Yet the initial approach to Milner was a feint, and soon, a different warning would report them crossing the mountain range. This gave the attackers an ideal opportunity to cause serious harm, and although they would be intercepted by 44 Allied fighters, the Japanese bombers would be able to penetrate the defensive fighter screen. Failing again to take advantage of their numerical superiority, the two Japanese formations separately attacked outlying fields, instead of concentrating on one important target. Nonetheless, the attackers would blanket the airstrips and crater the runways with bombs, successfully damaging numerous ground installations and some 15 aircraft, as well as destroying three B-25s and a bowfighter on the ground. The Japanese also claimed the sinking of a transport anchored in the harbour and the destruction of 28 enemy planes, although only two P-39s would be shot down. In contrast, the Japanese lost two Zeros and seven Bettys. On April 14th, as the Japanese air offensive was nearing its conclusion, Yamamoto would yet again send off the next attack in person, this time against Milner Bay. With a combined strength of 196 aircraft, including 75 Zeros and 23 Vals from the carriers Hiyo and Junyo, that were joined by 54 fighters and 44 Bettys from Admiral Kosaka's 11th Air Fleet, the Japanese set out to deliver a deadly blow against the Allied forces. Although Milner Bay enjoyed a low cloud base for most of the year, with the nearby mountains making flying in this area a dangerous proposition, the attackers had gotten lucky when they chose their last objective, as the Allies had rerouted most of their shipping to Milner Bay due to the recent raid on Port Moresby. Fortunately, the Allies would receive advance warning of the attack, so the Australian harbourmaster, Commander Geoffrey Branson, would order the vessels to disperse while General Kenny scrambled some 44 fighters to intercept the enemy's strike. Yet despite the best efforts of the Allied airmen, the Japanese would once again get through, with their bombers attacking Milner Bay in several waves. Initially, high-level bombers dropped at least 100 bombs on the anchorage, with dive bombers then beginning to attack the Allied shipping in the area. As a result of the raid, the Dutch troop transport, Van Heemskerk, would be beached after suffering several hits which set it ablaze. The British cargo ship, Gorgon, would also be bombed and set on fire, although the blaze would be extinguished later on. 
and the Dutch transport Van Althorn, as well as the Australian minesweepers Wagger and Kapunda, would be damaged by near misses. The air duel, meanwhile, resulted in eight Japanese aircraft destroyed, one Kitty Hawk shot down, four more P-40s heavily damaged, and one Lightning being forced to crash land. At Rabaul, the returning air crews would then report another series of hugely inflated results. Three large transports and one medium transport sunk, six transports heavily damaged and set on fire, and 44 Allied planes shot down for certain. Though Yamamoto had planned to carry out an additional fighter sweep on April 16th, reconnaissance flights would fail to turn up adequate targets on New Guinea's northeast coast. This finally brought an end to Operation Ego, as Japanese losses were mounting up and the already launched attacks appeared to have been a great success. Yamamoto and his staff were highly encouraged by the deceptive reports submitted by the air crews, completely believing that the Allies had suffered tremendous damage. In reality, however, the air offensive had failed to inflict serious damage on Allied forces. The only real consequence of Operation Ego was that American operations in the Solomons were set back about 10 days, with bombing and mine-laying sorties being postponed to hold back aircraft in case the Japanese launched more airstrikes. Had the Japanese followed up on this offensive with more air raids, they might have succeeded at their objective of preventing the future invasion of the Central Solomons, but alas this would not be the case. Yet the most important consequence would be Yamamoto's decision to carry out a tour of the forward area in order to raise the morale of the men stationed there, just as he had done in Rabaul, an action that would have a dire effect on the future of the Japanese Empire. On April 17th, Vice Admiral Ogaki Matume, Yamamoto's Chief of Staff, would also chair a conference to review the lessons learned from the aerial offensive, notably including the tendency of Japanese warplanes to catch fire after just a few hits with incendiary or even tracer rounds. With the conclusion of Operation Ego, a positive mood spread outwards in Rabaul once again after so much time, resulting in an atmosphere reminiscent of the early days of the Pacific War. But unfortunately for the Japanese, this boost in morale would be brief, as we'll see in a couple of weeks. Next episode, we'll head back to the North Pacific and to CBI for the coverage of some new and exciting developments in these two often overlooked theatres. If you want to watch this episode and more, make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Recently, we've started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive videos. Join the ranks of patrons and YouTube members via the link in the description or by pressing the button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, join our private Discord, and much more. Please consider liking, commenting, and sharing. It helps immensely. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.